The first week of September 2022 marked the beginning of a profound shift for the British government, the likes of which had not been seen in decades. On Monday the 5th, embattled Prime Minister Boris Johnson stepped down amidst a number of scandals that will no doubt taint his legacy in the years to come. Johnson was officially succeeded by Conservative Liz Truss, a political lightweight who is now tasked with handling a veritable economic crisis. And then, on Thursday the 8th, tragedy struck, as Queen Elizabeth II, the beloved sovereign and longest reigning monarch in British history, passed away at the age of 96. The Queen's death captured the soul of the world, leaving the United Kingdom in a state of mourning and prompting statements of condolence from every corner of the globe. The historic effects of these two events have yet to be fully determined, but so far, we know one thing for certain. While the Queen's passing will no doubt carry a profound cultural impact, it will not be nearly as politically influential as the election of the new Prime Minister. But this was not always the case. In fact, if we rewind 1,000 years, we'd find ourselves in a Britain where the monarch ruled with absolute unchecked authority, and in which a king's death could lead to complete political turmoil. Then, slowly over time, Parliament found a way to rip the sovereign's control straight out of his hands, until eventually there was hardly anything left for them to do. Welcome back to Historian's Corner, where today we'll be discussing how Parliament stole power from the English crown. The birth of England can be traced all the way back to 1066, when William the Conqueror took much of the British Isles by force. However, the first Parliament of England was not formally established until the 13th century. In the approximately 150 years in between, it was standard practice for the monarch to hold advisory meetings with the most influential figures in the land. These included, but were not limited to, bishops, abbots, nobles, and landowners. It could be argued that these individuals had some sort of voice in the governmental process, but unfortunately their voices meant nothing if they fell on deaf ears. And this is ultimately what happened when King John ascended to the throne in 1199. John, just like every other regent before him, had adhered to the principle of vis et voluntas, which is a Latin phrase which translates force and will. Essentially, this meant that kings were considered to be above the law and could potentially make executive decisions without much regard for the impact on how this could affect the common man. Almost a century and a half of the sovereign acting with impunity, combined with many other missteps in John's reign, led the king's advisors to decide that they'd had had enough. In 1215, the feudal barons forced the king to sign the Magna Carta, and in so doing, agree to three fundamental limitations on his authority. First, it did away with the idea that the king was above the law. Second, it stipulated that he could only make laws and raise taxes with the explicit consent of his counselors. And third, it made clear that the king's subjects did not owe their obedience to him simply because he was their ruler. Much to the council's surprise, John dutifully accepted the terms from day one, following the guidance of his advisors and instructing his successor, Henry III, to do the same. He never complained or made a fuss, and the monarchy has peacefully coexisted with the parliament until the present day. Just kidding. In actuality, John immediately prepared to oppose the conditions of the treaty, appealing to the Pope to have the Magna Carta annulled and the barons excommunicated. Thus began the First Barons' War, a two-year period of civil conflict which ended victory for the rebel army, the death of King John, and the ascension of his son. And considering that the new regent was only nine years old at the time he took the throne, he was easily coerced into accepting the new limitations on his power. Limitations which would only increase in magnitude as the years wore on. The road toward an England completely governed by its parliament unbelievably got off to a running start. As early as 1236, a second Baron Rebellion had forced Henry III to grant his parliament a say in matters from foreign policy to taxation to justice. But don't be mistaken, none of this is to say that parliament during this period was able to make decisions or pass legislation for the country. Quite the contrary. For several hundred more years following the signing of the Magna Carta, parliament merely advised the king with the latter having much influence and control over the former. 
Sometimes the king could even pass laws or increase taxes without the nobility's consent. But that possibility was eliminated during the reign of Edward III. In 1341, Parliament took another huge step forward in expanding its power by splitting Parliament into two houses. The nobility, barons, and bishops that had hitherto exercised influence over the king would occupy the House of Lords, while the House of Commons would be occupied by more ordinary men. This, along with other moderating reforms, gave non-nobles a voice in their government, whereas before they had solely been subject to the will of the higher-ups. Then, in the 16th century, the government of the United Kingdom finally started to look a little like it does today. It was during this period that the tradition began of MPs proposing bills to be considered by Parliament, rather than the King drafting legislation to be considered by his subjects. If this bill were to receive a majority vote in both houses, it would then go to the monarch for either royal assent or veto. Thus, the beginnings of a parliamentary democracy took shape. Even though the sovereign still had absolute power over which bills would become law. Now, you might expect that the next step in Parliament's modernization would include limiting the power of the king in some way. Perhaps the drafting of a constitution that would make him little more than a glorified figurehead. Uh, but the history of Parliament was just about to take a dramatic, radical turn. Because, well, Cromwell happened. As the 16th century gave way to the 17th century, the members of Parliament grew to distrust and dislike the monarchy. Charles I, who began ruling in 1625, was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And in retrospect, it's not hard to see why. At one point, Charles dissolved the Parliament and ruled without them for more than a decade. By 1648, the people decided that they had had enough, beheading Charles and replacing him with the new Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell. The trouble here, however, is that Parliament replaced the King with Cromwell at least partially because they thought he would rule with less of an iron fist. That was emphatically not the case. In fact, Cromwell fundamentally did not understand how Parliaments of the past had worked in relation with the King to pass legislation. As every single session began, Cromwell decided he didn't like sharing his power and promptly dissolved the houses. It's no wonder then that when Oliver Cromwell died and was succeeded by his weaker-willed son Richard, Parliament acted to restore the monarchy with Charles II at the head. Understandably, after this point, the English crown never quite had the same power it once had, gradually losing its sway over time. Some monarchs, Charles II and George III, for example, made unsuccessful attempts to consolidate their authority, but were ultimately forced to submit when Parliament pushed back. The 18th century waned, and with it died the absolute monarchy that had governed Britain since its inception. For the last two and a half centuries, Parliament has written and passed laws, while the royal veto has become a thing of the past. It is worth noting, however, that while the United Kingdom is a parliamentary republic in practice, it is constitutionally still a monarchy. And that means that the head of state today could overrule any law they saw fit to crush, no matter how popular or beneficial. To be fair, most Britons don't seem too worried about this possibility, since their kings and queens have not vetoed any legislation since 1707. Nonetheless, as long as the possibility exists, there will be people out there who wish to take advantage of it for their own personal gain. One must hope that no English monarch would be malevolent enough to go down that path, and they've probably got a point. But if that day ever does come, may God help the United Kingdom avoid a constitutional crisis. So, what do you think? Will the British throne ever try to resurrect its power in the future? Will there come a day when England will decide to do away with kings and queens altogether? Or is Parliament posed to continue in its current role for centuries to come? Let us know your thoughts down in the comments. Thanks again for watching Historian's Corner, and we'll see you in the next video.